Hey everyone, I'm Jack and also Alex, and in today's video we'll be covering the bosses of Marvel's Spider-Man 2 from worst to best. With the Sinister Six of old being massacred by the ravenous Kraven the Hunter in the early hours of the game, Spider-Man 2's bosses are much more varied from character to character this time around and remain a consistent aspect of the story. Before we get in, we'd like to thank our patrons as always, and if you'd like to subscribe, join from the link in the description. With all that said, let's get into the ranking. Number 11, Symbio Behemoth. One thing I'd like to applaud Insomniac for is making the MJ segments not boring slogs anymore. Far from it, she's the most powerful character in the game. Everyone else has to punch enemies until their skulls cave in to even knock them out, but not MJ. MJ can just outright one-shot everything in the game with that busted-ass taser thing from Sable, excluding, of course, the Symbio Behemoth. There are technically two of these in the game, but the other one that you fight as Peter dies if you so much as sneeze on him too hard, so we're not even counting that fraud. This guy is tricky if you approach him in an outright firefight, so trying to juke him out with fancy footwork is out of the question. Thus, your best recourse is leading him along on a world tour of every single iconic Sonic Bomb location in the room, which is conveniently full of them for some reason. The Symbio Behemoth picking a fight here is like Frosty the Snowman challenging you to a death match inside a sauna. Clearly, Venom has never gotten around to reading Sun Tzu's Art of War yet, because I'm pretty sure there's a chapter somewhere in there about not doing that kind of thing. This fight is fine, but he's pushed down by being a nobody without any large-scale flashy moments. Number 10, Mr. Negative. As much as I think Spider-Man 2 as an overall game is fantastic, its bosses were, in my opinion, far less interesting than in the first two games in the series. Every single fight, bar maybe two, are just four to five minutes too long for my liking. In the case of Mr. Negative, he's about 15 minutes too long, but that's just my point. All the bosses are only that long because they either have a needlessly large number of phases, passive sequences where you just fight enemies, or dragged out cutscenes with little to no player interaction. In the previous two Spider-Man games, there were QTEs in almost every boss, but in this game, there's essentially none. I feel like God of War type finishers would have made the fight so much more rewarding and engaging. Obviously not Peter like grabbing Kraven by the cock and twisting it off, but just some cool Spider-Man shit to end it instead of the awkward transition to a cutscene after ending a combo. Finally on to Mr. Negative, even though Kraven and eventually Venom were priority one, for Miles the real goal was always to get a chance at revenge with Martin Lee. Craven gives him this opportunity late in the story, and as great as the atmosphere and buildup was, I felt as if the fight was just simply mediocre. The combat system is awesome, but in a similar vein to the LEGO Skywalker saga, making the major boss fights just normal engagements set within the mechanical confines of the combat brings their quality down dramatically. And when you tack on that almost every fight has at least four phases with zero evolution in gimmicks or moveset, they begin to feel unsurprisingly repetitive. With Mr. Negative, none of his moves particularly stand out besides the negative energy slashes, but even then they happen so often because his moveset is only three or four attacks in total that they aren't interesting even after just one phase. At the beginning of each new phase, he spawns in with an impenetrable shield only broken by charging up chain lightning. From here, it's the same thing, and the same thing. Eventually, he grabs hold of Miles and warps him to a negative land where he clichely breaks down Miles' life over fucking 10 minutes. You genuinely just fight enemies for the runtime and equivalent boredom of like three Spotify ads four separate times while he does some dumb bullshit at a torturously slow pace. I mean, couldn't they have just done all of this in like a cutscene? Nonetheless, after this segment, it closes with a pretty unremarkable chase, and then Miles actually saves Martin Lee rather than killing him or whatever the game was hinting towards. I get the suspense of Miles potentially breaking the Spider-Man golden rule and murdering someone, but that also is never gonna happen unless he too was infected by the symbiote. This fight is as aptly descriptive a thing you'll ever find to fit under the umbrella of time-wasting pieces of ass gunk. Number 9, Wraith. Fun fact, the voice actors for Peter and Wraith have been married in real life for over 20 years, and Wraith's real name is Yuri, which is the name of Peter's voice actor. Must have been a fun day in the recording booth. This is the second hardest fight in the game for me personally, with all the insanely fast blue attacks she tosses out and how bad I was at parrying for the first 75% of the game. This fight was definitely one of the more gameplay-intensive ones, which I generally like, 
but I can't help but care more about flashy stuff in a game like Spider-Man that's so good at making those big intense moments. It was entertaining, sure, but five years from now, if somebody comes up to me and goes, yo, remember Spider-Man 2? I'm gonna think of Sandman punching miles through 25 uh, miles worth of skyscrapers, not parrying Wraith over and over. That and, of course, the conflict between lethal vigilantes and good boys like Spider-Man and Batman has been represented to death in games, so this whole plotline has a been there, done that stink to it. Intensity derived from its challenge and the passable story make Wraith a decent boss in a similar vein to Taskmaster from the first game. Number 8, Peter Parker. I'm not sure they needed an entire boss fight that's weirdly slotted in directly after Kraven to cure Peter of his symbiote. If anything, I feel as if this should have been its own unique mission, but because it happens so immediately after the climax of the Kraven v Spider-Man saga that the entire game had been building up to, the dramatic effect this clearly aimed for wasn't particularly emphatic. The escalation of this whole thing was pretty extreme, and for the second time, this glaring narrative flaw could have been easily resolved with an intricately made mission. That said, the boss is… alright. As is the case with the likes of Wraith and a few more foes higher on the list, most of the fights are just fights. Realistically, there's very little that separates any of them mechanically aside from minute differences in environmental traps, but in terms of movesets, almost all have three hit combos, one heavy attack, one crush attack, and uh… that's kinda it. That's why I said what I said before about bosses being vehemently repetitious. In, say, the Arkham games, the bosses are actually pretty decent for the most part because almost all of them have unique gimmicks that change the approach you use to beat them. Only a select few rely on the normal combat system for their entire fight, and those that do, like Two-Face in Arkham City, kind of stink. If we were to remove everything and just set this fight as polygons in code, there is zero difference between something like Symbiote Spider-Man and the average shysty wearing store robber that apparently makes up like half of New York's population. Why couldn't they have made a sequence like Firefly, a stealth fight like Mr. Freeze, or a QTE encounter like Deathstroke? There's just a lack of creativity among all the bosses in Spider-Man 2, yes, even the best one, that collectively leaves a bland, lasting impression. Peter is like many in this game in that he's an enemy you hit, an enemy you web, and an enemy you dodge. I don't mean to come off as negative, because truth be told, I really do enjoy this game, but I'd be lying if I didn't tell you I think the bosses were by far the weakest aspect of it. Number 7, Mysterio. I love Mysterio, he's got one of my favorite character designs in the Spider-Man rogues gallery, and thankfully, unlike in Spider-Man Far From Home, he actually uses the damn suit for more than like 10 seconds. Well, technically it's not him, but you know what I mean. I'm glad it was a fake, because I was rather fond of the notion of supervillains hanging up the masks and getting a start flipping burgers, so to speak. It'd have been super dumb if Quentin just pissed away his promising looking new career for no good reason. The fun of this fight is mainly thanks to two things. One, it looks cool. I dig the trippy Mysterio world and how illusion-y it looks. Secondly, the clones all fly around. This is big because it means you can web zip between them over and over and maintain essentially infinite airtime with not a single second spent doing anything other than punching or hurtling through the air. It also utilizes Mysterio's abilities well, with things like the fake out ending standing out as cool in character tactics. He doesn't overshadow too many of the main bosses to the point that it makes him look bad, but as a side mission finale, I respect his game. Number 6, Scree. Aw yeah. As much as I'd argue that once again this is just sort of a fight, I think Scream is badass as fuck. I do think this was really random, but that's the sort of stuff I like. Why not include her? You have Venom, you have a symbiote prone female, you might as well. Visually Scream is pretty great, and her arena also includes sound bombs along with the sonic blast mechanic that are all going for her. But like Peter, she has a repetitious and small set of attacks that becomes mind numbing to go against as you fight her for 4 phases. I'm super excited for Andrew Santino to morph into Carnage in whatever capacity they bring him in in the near future, but I do have to say that one, I hope he'll be more of a Kronos sort of spectacle if you do fight him, and two, I would have been all for a bunch more of the classic symbiotes showing up here. I guess in terms of power scaling and realism for the universe, Spider-Man barely handling Scream and then somehow taking down like Toxin would have been a bit over the top, but how cool would that have been, like a symbiote gank where you and Miles take on the lethal protector group? Anyway, Scream is cool for what she is, but it's still just a fight that's a fight and is a fight and that's all she'll ever be. Number 5, Sandman. This is a lot of people's favorite boss apparently, and I mean, I can see it. 
The game was spectacular, making people feel powerful. I had no idea Sandman was packing power like this. Sure, he may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but who needs brains when you can decimate New York City single-handedly? Marco going all out could be a threat even worse than stuff like Devil's Breath if he decided to treat civilian casualties like an arcade game. I'd definitely skip town if I caught wind of something like that coming up. As far as gameplay, he's nothing too crazy in that a lot of the fight is just beating up goons and going through tutorial pop-ups. I was uncharacteristically irritated for a lot of these for whatever reason despite the generally smooth integration which is one of those things that does matter to me in my assessment of a boss. If a doctor sees a patient who is sick and can't figure out why, he doesn't declare him healthy. Some intangible feature that I cannot isolate made this fight less fun for me than it was for other people. It's like the evil version of je ne sais quoi, I don't know what I'd call it. Curious if anyone else felt like this or if I'm just forgetting to take my meds, feel free to let me know. That said, he's still a cool boss, don't get me wrong. Punching his giant sandy mug after dousing him in water is some classic Spider-Man problem solving, but I think a little less gooning would have made it better. That's what I'm gonna call that, gooning, a verb for a fight dragging out too long thanks to an excessive amount of goons. This game loves gooning. Number 4, Kraven vs. Spider-Man. While he's still a base combat encounter, Kraven is about as creative as this game gets within that web without having the benefit of being the final boss. Unlike basically every other fight up to this point, he has layers to his design, and the arena provides more than just a few disposable environmental tools and a neat visual. When I mentioned the Arkham bosses earlier as a comparison, I think this could have been the boss to really get wonky and break the cycle of comfort that Insomniac clearly fell into with the boss design. Maybe a stealth set Segment, maybe a PvP sort of bit, but for what it is, this fight is still absolutely solid. As you learn throughout the story, Kraven is a master of not just hand-to-hand -hand martial arts, but the skills of understanding enemy weakness and stealth, and this fight taps into all three traits. The first phase is a pretty run-of-the-mill fist fight with nothing of note happening, but phase two is where it gets much more inventive. In varying periods throughout, Kraven will launch a spear at the large church bell, sending the Venom symbiote into a frenzy where you're completely vulnerable. You can only stop it by webbing the bell, but while you do this, you also need to avoid Craven. I'm usually not a fan of enemy padding, but here it's a small portion size so it doesn't matter, and maybe I just got lucky, but while I feel like the dogs were in the arena, he'd almost always hop into stealth mode or just avoid going in on me altogether. A few times during this phase, Craven will go invisible and perch himself on a tree and snipe at you too. I like this because it's just different, but I do wish he could have maybe gone invisible more and had a high damage backstab or something. As much as I think this first Craven fight could have been so much better, relative to all the bosses before him on this list, he is a massive leap in quality. Number 3, Lizard. Personally, if I lost an arm, I'd replace it with a super strong metal one that could punch through walls and have a machine gun and a flamethrower installed into it. I don't know why Dr. Connors took the lizard DNA route just to try and get a boring old normal arm back. Other than that, though, he seems like a pretty smart stand-up fellow, and it's a shame that he has to get the snot beat out of him for the good of the city, but that's part of the job, I suppose. What's not normally part of the job, however, is that evil-ass commentary Symbiote Pete makes while beating his ass. I'm a Maguire shill for life, but they definitely did Symbiote Pete right in this game. He's a real fucker sometimes. Lizard is a fun boss to wail on, though, so I can understand getting caught up in the thrill of the hunt. Maybe Craven was onto something after all. This is a fight with a bunch of phases if you consider a change in arena a new phase, but they play rather similarly. I personally am not fond of the web-slinging segments in the middle of boss fights like with Shocker in the last game since they feel drawn out, but it's not enough to majorly lower the Lizard's esteem in my eyes. When you're actually fighting him, it's got a similar fun level to Wraith, I would say, but a bit more so thanks to the wall-crawling action and lessened time spent getting my ass beat into the floor. Yet again, another great example of utilizing a villain I never quite respected the full strength of to the utmost. Props to the folks making those mid-fight cutscenes, although I wish they were a bit more QTE heavy so they felt interactive in a God of War-ish way. Number 2, Venom. Phase evolution is a pretty incredible thing. If From Software hadn't discovered this like 15 years ago, I would marvel at it, but raving about this feature would be like going to a science fair and giving a Nobel Prize to the kid genius who figured out that if you drop an apple, it falls because of gravity. It is mind-blowing that this fight is split into five fucking phases that are almost entirely identical, albeit dynamic, but the only difference is that the latter two in the Emily May Foundation have the inclusion of a winged venom who shows up for maybe 15 
15 seconds at a time, but by the nature of just simple change, this creates a unique level of variety that no other boss has. That's also disregarding the sheer scale here, as well as the cutscenes, but really, I mean, yeah, that's kind of it. When you're not dealing with his basic attacks, Venom can summon symbiotes who die to webs. Like Craven, I think this is a very defensible case for added enemies, and honestly, they create a necessary layer of difficulty on top of the additional health bars that the second and third phases at the school have. Venom will also occasionally render ground floors completely useless, meaning you need to web zip to a safe spot or shift arenas entirely. Movement is so key with fights in games like this, and if it isn't already obvious, Venom nailed it. Otherwise, I don't have a ton to say. I do think once again this dragged on a tad too long, but it's still great, just simply not fun enough to beat out our number one. Number 1, Craven vs. Venom. Sure, fighting Venom is awesome, cool gothic wing design and all, but you know what's even better? Playing as him. Poor Harry had spent the whole game trying to develop sustainable beehive vaccine science disability ramps for disabled deaf bodies or whatever the shit, and what's the thanks he gets? Parker going up and telling him to pop more pills. That was brutal. So honestly, I think he earned the chance to go a little ape and have some reckless fun. Let his nuts hang, you know what I mean. Thankfully, it's just as pleasant for us as it is for him. Craven has spent all game off-screening people and building quite a fearsome name for himself, so this final deathmatch is carrying a lot of heft. Unleashing the full brunt of Venom's wrath on him is badass as hell. I absolutely loved sending his rockets back at him and countering him with megaton impact punches. The fact that Craven held his own so long against Venom is pretty nuts. I had no idea he was that tough prior to playing the game. And of course, that finale is incredible. After a long life of mounting many heads on his walls, Craven's own head gets gobbled down as Symbiote Chow. Then again, Craven is basically Dragon Ball Super Goku, so I'm sure he went out with a toothy grin on his face. In more than one sense, this fight was a grand display of symbiosis, and definitely the finest hour of Spider-Man 2. Thank you so much for watching, and we hope you enjoyed. Remember to like and subscribe if you haven't, and otherwise be sure to check in every Wednesday for new uploads. That's all for now. Deuces.